Most North Americans are immigrants or the descendants of immigrants. We've all ended up here from somewhere else. On Toronto Spadina Avenue, there are still some Jews who can tell you what it was like to be a stranger in a strange land, when they can remember, and if they choose to tell you. Where did you come from? I came from Poland, from one of the best cities. Do you remember what it was like when you first came? It was very good. It was a pleasure. How so? A long story. When I came here, I was very young. I was 13 years old. It's a, it's a lifetime, believe me. Nobody likes to move. Who wants to leave family, friends, a home? But sometimes there is no choice. And for the Jews who came from Eastern Europe to Canada, Spadina Avenue became the place to begin a new life. Between the turn of the century and the 1950s, Spadina became the center of a Jewish community of some 60,000 place in the time nurtured ambition and idealism. There was the possibility of a better life, if not for oneself, at least for one's children, and perhaps, who knows, for the world at large. Much of the Toronto of 1900 has changed beyond recognition, but not Spadina. It was an ideal setting for the building of a new community. Plenty of cheap houses, room to build stores and synagogues, and most important, places to work. The garment industry at the south end of Spadina was built by the Jewish entrepreneurs, who, over the past 75 years, have competed against each other for supremacy. Their number is on the decrease, but on Spadina, you can still get a good price for a garment, if you know the right person. But is this not the same shape as that, no, as the light one? one? That's a different one. Oh, this it... has a right on shoulder. You know, the other one has a square shoulder oh. here. Take Bernie Wise, for example. He considers himself an artist with fur. This has a right on shoulder, and, and I, you see, I cut on out. The front is shaped, the back is straight. The front is shaped and the back And the back is, is a little bit, you know, fuller. It spreads out in the bottom. Yeah. What I had in mind was like a perfectly straight coat. The workers who assemble Bernie's merchandise work from his own designs. They sell all over the world. It used to be that the owner's son naturally went into the business, but these days, it's rare. Can I get me those spots? Yeah, it's a slab finish here. I need four. Even if Alan Wise is the exception, you have to wonder if he really had any choice. On Sunday mornings, my father used to bring me into the factory to do work. Like other kids used to play hockey, I came into work. Every Sunday morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, he'd pull me out of bed. And when you're 10 years old, 6 o'clock in the morning is, ah, uh, really bad. He's a tough person to work for. He's a perfectionist. And just the littlest mistake, he always finds it. Always. How do you feel about the fact that in 1985, your dad's going to let you take over? I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, assuming in 1985 that it's all yours, are you nervous about it? Uh, no, because my father will still be around. Even if he says he'll be all mine in 1985, he'll still, he'll still be the boss. He'll still come walking in with his cane and looking, Bill, what are you doing today? Young guys like Alan who work down here don't alter the fact that the number of Jews on Spadina gets smaller all the time. Only a few Jewish landmarks remain to recall an almost lost world. One of them is United Bakers. This is an avenue that's got three or four different prices. Yeah. It's your price, his price, the wholesale, and the profit price. Hello, United. Herman Ladovsky runs the United Ooh. Bakers Dairy Restaurant. Yeah. Not yet. Henry's here. But it was founded in 1912 by his father, Aaron Ladovsky and has been located on Spadina Avenue since 1920. United has become a Jewish hangout for a generation that doesn't want to leave the past too far behind. As in the old days, they come here to discuss the news of the day 
and review the state of the world. Not in the Constitution. Maybe we get somewhere. I think it's a red herring, personally. Another landmark is just across the avenue, Sammy Taft's hat store. Once upon a time, real men wore hats, and the high prince of headgear was Sammy Taft. Just stand right here, Michael, if you don't mind. Just in front of the mirror. Along with his regular clientele, anybody who was anybody stopped by Sam's store for a fitting and to pose for a photograph. The store's walls are a showbiz museum. You look like seven or seven and an eighth, so we'll play it by ear. OK, Sam, it's up to you. Early each day, the Minsker Synagogue opens its doors for morning prayers. To perform the entire service requires a minion, a quorum of 10 men. And somehow it still manages to happen. Perhaps because no matter what situation Jews find themselves in, our relationship with Judaism is most important. It's a relationship that can be stretched, but never broken. The Jews who settled in Spadina came from Eastern Europe. The Pale of Settlement, governed by the Russian Tsars, was where they were permitted to live. Today, that area is part of Poland dwelling mainly in the small villages, the shtetls, or in outlying cities like Celts and Ofstrofs, life was governed by the laws of religious tradition. By the late 1800s, the economic situation was intolerable, but it was the pogroms, organized campaigns of violence against the Jews, that convinced many that enough was enough. America became the destination. It wasn't unusual for these immigrants to have only the vaguest notion of where they were going. America simply meant freedom, so it really didn't make much difference if they landed in New York or Halifax. Most were willing to sacrifice nearly everything just to get here. For the Jewish aliens who had landed in Toronto, it might as well have been another planet. What they saw was a predominantly Anglo-Saxon and Protestant community. Its inhabitants had odd names like Eton and Simpson. They had strange holidays like the Glorious Twelfth. The rapidly growing city needed immigrant labor, so immigrants were welcome or at least tolerated. Spadina Avenue really became a Jewish neighborhood around the time of the First World War. Thousands had fled Europe, and the concentration of Jewish immigrants shifted from the poorer areas to the avenue. The sound of Yiddish filled the streets as Jewish merchants appeared on Spadina. They were easily recognized by their bilingual signs. Katrate Drugstore, translated into Yiddish is, Katre Drugstore. And so an Irish working class area was gradually transformed into a Jewish working class neighborhood. Not all of the stores were to be found on the avenue itself. Many began on neighboring streets in the front parlors of homes. Marketplaces to serve the new Jewish population were established where there had been none before. Ben Lappin grew up near the most famous of these, Kensington Market. We settled into um, 196 Augusta Avenue that faced Baldwin Street, you know, and Kensington, the present romantic Kensington Markets, although that time it wasn't so romantic. Mm -hmm. 
Kensington grew out of a very real need. The widespread observance of Jewish dietary laws required kosher slaughtered meat and chicken. And so a Jewish marketplace became the essential support of a way of life. A variety of stores in the area catered to the other requirements of the traditional diet. Fish, dairy products, and baked goods. It was not a very air-conditioned kind of street at that time. I remember on Friday mornings after market day on Thursday, the aroma was not exactly uh, uh, pleasing. I remember the policeman, as I uh, recall, coming in, I'd watch him coming in from Spadina Avenue, and he'd take one big breath and try to hold it until he came out on Augusta Avenue and exhaled it. Today, Kensington serves the Portuguese, West Indian, and Chinese communities. But there are still a few Jewish merchants around, and on certain days, more than a glimpse of the past can be seen, if you know where to look. One of the central themes of Judaism has been that God required a group of men and women to represent a sense of order in the world. So Jews were commanded to stand apart from their pagan neighbors in order to retain a sense of holiness. If Kensington had an unholy smell, well, it was part of life. Like all religions, it is the distinct customs that establish identity, even if some of them appear a bit mystifying. Kapuris takes place during the High Holidays. When it originated during the Middle Ages, it satisfied the need for a little bit of magic. Your sins were transmitted to a chicken. Kapuris was never sanctioned by the religious authorities, and it was a custom that gave the non-Jewish population an uneasy feeling. Perhaps this group of immigrants was not quite what the city needed. Constantly bewildered by customs they did not understand, Many hoped that Jews would soon assimilate, learn English, and become good Canadians. Well, many Jews did attend the Spadina Avenue area churches, like the former Western Congregational Church, after it had been purchased and converted by the Hebrew men of England. There was a synagogue on practically every corner. Some were elaborate renovations, others were simply converted houses. They were founded by immigrants who had come from the same shtetl or city in the old country. In the old country, life and Judaism were inseparable. Religious leaders had tremendous power. Work stopped on the Sabbath. Holy days were strictly observed. But in the New World, in Toronto, the pattern of life was different. There were new values. For the majority, work would come first, and the demands of work would conflict with the demands of religion. <laughs> On Sukkot, the completion of the yearly cycle of reading the Torah is celebrated. The Torah is not only the source of major holidays like Sukkot, but for centuries it also marked the entire rhythm of Jewish life. But if Sukkot fell on a working day, few would be able to attend synagogue. A livelihood could not be sacrificed. The luckiest immigrants were those who had a skill. Tailors, shoemakers, blacksmiths, bakers. In the old country, for every person who could make ends meet, there were many who could not. The T. Eaton Company hired many immigrants almost as soon as they arrived in Toronto. There was a need for skilled labor. Alongside workers of other nationalities, Jews cut, stitched and sewed merchandise for the thriving department store and catalog businesses. The wages weren't wonderful, and the hours were long, but it was a start. Those who were ambitious had only brief careers as workers. They went into business for themselves just as soon as possible. Often they started out by manufacturing products for their former employers. The new businesses began in the lofts of Spadina houses. As they prospered, the houses were torn down and replaced by factory buildings.
Today, the workers on Spadina represent many nationalities. The needle trade continues to be a good access point for a job. Primrose Garments is in the tradition of the large, old-time manufacturers on the avenue. You know, this new stuff is way lighter. No, no, I don't want it. No, I want the darker. Yeah, but we don't have that much. That's why. Oh, yes, you do. Huh? Its owner, Alex yeah, Davis, is a typical self-made businessman. First to arrive in the morning, last to leave at the end of the day. And in between, he personally supervises every detail of his company's marketing and manufacturing operations. At full tilt, Alex has over 100 workers on staff. They are his family, and a good part of his job is spurring them on to great heights. And he likes to deal personally with the buyers. Fabulous, fabulous coat. This came in from Paris yeah. after you were here. I kid you not. She is from Eton. Yes. For the buckles. Not bad for 1575. This lady is a real humdinger. <laughs> no, this is really a gorgeous. Look at the arm. I saw that Nicolini last week. This is how she's softening you up, you know. She's telling you all these stories. That's beautiful, Alec. How much is that? Uh, a lot less than Aqua Scudams. Mm -hmm. A lot less. I know, but you can't compare. I know you can because mine is better. Two ninety-five. Mm, that's that's a nice go. That mm. that's good value. Yeah. Exceptional good value. One hundred percent cashmere. Mm -hmm. So why did you buy some? Well, if I have any money and any demand for it. <laughs> Competition on the avenue was intense from the beginning. As time went on, the weaker of the new Jewish enterprises were knocked out by the stronger. Large operations like Superior Cloak and Tip Top Tailors came to dominate the industry, establishing dynasties and employing thousands of Jewish workers. Today, almost none of the original Spadina enterprises remain on the avenue. One of the few is reliable for dressers and dyers. It was started by Harry Topper. I met a number of friends who have been engaged in various trades. I use the word trades quite advisedly, not professions. Very few professions were then available to Jewish people, as, for instance, lawyers or engineers or accountants, very few. So Harry got a job with a fur dressing and dyeing company, known as Holman and Sable. I was a long time with Holman and Sable. I was many years with Holman and Sable, and then I became a foreman. And the uh, dressing and dyeing I would say was in its infancy then. With the training he had acquired, Harry Topper started his own business in direct competition with his former employers. When reliable fur dressers and dyers eventually overtook the established Hallman and Sable, Harry moved his company back to the very same premises where he had been a worker. Harry had won, but the fight was tough. Hallman was a Gentile, Sable was a Jew, but they had a very pleasant relationship. And they both devoted all their energies to, to dressing and dyeing. And Sable, as a pleasant a man he was, he was a very unpleasant competitor. Yeah, very ruthless competitor, as a matter of fact. Very ruthless. And no matter what price we charged for our articles, he always charged a few pennies less. He didn't have to charge much less because the penny was an important thing then. Harry's son, Victor, is now president of the company his father started. The 
fur business is probably uh, one of the few industries in the world where the only way you can make a success at it is if you're a gambler. It used to be a business for older people. And, and I remember my dad saying this is not a business to bring children into. But that has changed because fur has become a fashion. It didn't take much capital to open a factory. A few sewing machines, a press iron, and you were in business. But to keep it all going, the garment industry depended upon a constant and massive supply of labor. In the 1920s, a garment worker was lucky to earn $25 a week. For women, it was much less. Wages were based upon the amount of work accomplished, not the amount of time spent working. It was the relentless pace to earn enough to survive that gave the term sweatshop its meaning. Poets and writers of the time dramatized the life of the needle trades worker. Much of their work was set to music. Mein Ruheplatz, my resting place, expresses the hardship of a lifetime spent working in the factories. Organizations like the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, workers fought for a decent livelihood. The International and the other major unions had local offices in the Toronto Labour Lyceum. Located on Spadina Avenue, it was the centre of union activity. It wasn't easy to organize workers in the 20s and 30s. Going on a strike then was much more dangerous. Police were often called into the scene of a strike to control the striking workers and their sympathizers. When police tried to make arrests, violent clashes occurred. Early strikes were met with failure and success was often fleeting. An agreement would cover one season and the following year, the workers would be forced to strike again. Joe Salzberg remembers those days very well. He came to Toronto at the age of 10 and became a cap maker, later a prominent national union organizer. Though a dedicated communist, he was a popular representative of Spadina in the Ontario legislature. See, the nature of the, uh, uh, the Jewish sector in the entire economic and social confrontation in the country was different. Why? Because whereas miners or lumberjacks or railway workers or steel and auto workers they faced large-scale monopoly, uh, finance monopoly uh, groupings, monopoly capital, big industry, big capital. There wasn't the capital and labor relationship that exists when you have absentee owners, corporations. Everybody knew everybody. Very often, the, 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 the needle trades worker that would be in a strike with an employer was socially also a member of the same Landsmannschaft of, uh, of the employer. In other words, he came from a certain part of Russia or Poland or Galicia or whatever, and, and they got into the industry because they knew somebody like that. But when they, they felt obliged to go out on a strike, they were fighting not only an employer, but an employer they knew who was only uh, uh, briefly removed from their own ranks, a former worker in the shop with them, who, because of skill, ambition, uh, breaks, became an employer, you see? And in that sense, the strikes often assumed a unique character. 
they belonged to the same synagogue. But all week they'd be on the picket line on Saturday. They would carry it into the synagogue, arguments and th things like that. In other words, there was a little bit a hangover of the old family relationship. Many of the employers were former leaders of union, too, you know. I could tell of an instance, for instance, in the millinery trade, where a meeting took place between the union and the employer's association, the millinery association. And every one but one of the representatives of the manufacturers was a former officer of the union. And at the meeting, there was a lot of us still at the end, arguments and threats from one side to the other. But when the negotiations were over, they all retired to a Jewish delicatessen store. And the bosses would argue among themselves which of them, in the presence of the union uh, uh, negotiating team, which of them was a better union than when he was in the union, you know? What are you talking about? One would say like that. You were never a good union man. I know, I was secretary of the union. Now, it was that unique uh, uh, phenomenon here that uh, you couldn't find, say, in a steel town or in a lumber town or so on. A Chinese restaurant now occupies the building that was once the Toronto Labour Lyceum. The unions have moved their offices to smaller quarters nearby. First of all, the financial report for tonight, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to run it off? Yeah, if you can, this afternoon. Still fighting for the workers is Al Hershkowitz. He has been involved with the union movement since he was a 15-year-old fur worker. He is now business agent for the Toronto local of the Fur Workers Union, the union he helped to build. I can make it now, okay. Don't yell, don't yell. Al's colleague, Max Fetterman, is manager of the Toronto local of the Fur Workers Union. Well, I'm only saying to you, listen, listen careful again. It's a question of money. The, 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 the world doesn't come to an end if you, if you stop even a, a couple of days later. But I'm only saying to you is, you shouldn't stop working. We had this problem before, we're having it again. And you're talking about the, hey, what is it? Well, I wouldn't advise you to make a stop it on this here. Well, call me back. You want to make a stoppage in a shop. A hundred people. If you make a stoppage, the first, the first trouble is we can take you to court. We can discuss even this question right now. And they, I got to pay a thousand dollars a day to my, myself and $100 for the workers. They can clean up your treasure in one The new rules of the game frustrate Max. Before. He's and been a fighter business. all his life. You cannot call a strike any little strike. After a phone call from the shop steward, Al goes down to the factory to investigate. There is a dispute over the rate of pay for a certain type of work. No. Did they figure out the rates already? Something. That's all. Well, what the hell? Take it easy. Al has come in to calm people's nerves as much as to settle the dispute. These days, the real fight is to save jobs in a declining industry. In any event, it's part of the season anyway. It's nothing new. You're used to it by now, no? Of course, fewer jobs mean fewer union members. So wandering through the factory, gives Al a chance to do some old-fashioned union organizing. Yeah, I know, but I like to go, but I can't move it. Well, Next time. it's a day. Yeah. Well, Henry, we, would you be able to give us a help in uh, some organizing? Uh, from the same organizing committee? Yeah, but we'll work a different team. OK? I'll see what I'm doing. See, like I just told you, I bought a house and I do a lot of work in that thing. But we won't ask too much, just a little bit. When we called a strike, we had in mind the, the system. We got to change the system. Today, you call a strike, we have in mind a few dollars. It's a big, big difference. But time is changing. I look forward to see more idealism in the trade union movement. Maybe we'll go back to the time when we start to organize trade unions. Getting involved in union organizing 
gave many of the young Jewish workers a feeling that they had some control over their destiny. But in struggling for better conditions, many saw the need for larger political changes. Socialism provided an attractive alternative. There was a genuine belief that not only could wages and working conditions be improved, but that great fundamental changes could be brought about by the will of the people. With the emergence of the Russian Revolution, as John Reed, uh, the American great writer, said, 10 days that shook the world, that also affected Jews of the world thinking. And there was a lot of faith that this revolution destroying the uh, hated regimes of the czars that brought the Jews nothing much else but uh, humiliation, deprivation, uh, pogroms, violent outbursts. And many people, including myself, began to look upon the Soviet Union as perhaps ushering in a new era, in a secular sense, messianic order that would liberate the world. We became terribly inspired. We became starry-eyed when we saw that. Many joined the communist movement for purely idealistic reasons. But there were many others who were drawn in by the social benefits. A friend of mine met some girls, and uh, there was a party that was being arranged, and he asked me whether I'd like to come along. I came along, and uh, this was a party arranged by, uh, by a group of uh, young communists. As a result of uh, being a furrier, being a member of the union, uh, I, I was asked to become active, and I'd attend the meetings and uh, participate. And, uh, of course, we, the group that was uh, influenced by the communist movement, were in opposition to the leadership of the union. And I had to join that opposition, and uh, we would criticize decisions that uh, the union isn't militant enough and so on. With the crash of 1929 and the onset of the Depression, support for left-wing ideologies increased. The major issue in those days was jobs, jobs, jobs. And there were demonstrations at a drop of a hat. You can always mount a demonstration because you had enough people unemployed. The Communist Party had achieved a level of respectability in the community, had the support within the labor movement generally, as a result of which, they were able to split the Fur Workers' Union. The 20s and 30s were the golden age of Jewish Spadina. It was a world within a world where unions, political organizations, and religious groups all sponsored a wide range of cultural, athletic, and educational activities. Everywhere you went, there were lively discussions of current events that whet everyone's appetite for many new ideas, and a very old one. There had always been the dream of returning to the biblical homeland, but according to tradition, this would have to await the coming of the Messiah. But in 1917, Britain recognized the Jewish claim in Palestine. Could mere mortals upstage the Messiah? The Zionists said yes. The Strand Theater, originally built for Yiddish drama, was the scene for many Zionist rallies. And at the bookstores and restaurants, Zionism was hotly debated. Like the socialists, the anarchists, and the social democrats, the labor Zionist movement, the Pola Zion, had their own hangout, Wallersteins. Esther Wallerstein Grant was too young to participate in the discussions, but she recalls the atmosphere in her father's restaurant. As a center, as a place of gathering, it was mostly those who came to be known as the labor Zionist group the term Russian intelligentsia would apply to a lot of them. It really was a surrogate home, I'd have to say, because there you could come and spend a few hours drinking a glass of tea and either reading or talking to somebody. Most of all, you met people there. These movements, not only the Zion movements, the socialist movement, the arbitrary, the communist movement, the uh, other movements, the... Uh, Mizrahi, the religious Zionist movement, they not only had the larger political view, but in the more immediate sense, they provided a real opportunity for us young people who were going through the Depression 
to retain a sense of, of, of self-worth during those difficult years. It was a time of economic crisis, but never an identity crisis, because um, we knew who we were, and these fed our sort of sense of identity, these opportunities to get together. There were, there were strong ties in this group, ties as close as family ties. Mm. Not only socializing, but a real concern for each other. And the ties remain strong ones. And I think that their discussions, their resolutions, they really thought this was going to change the world. I think generally there was a belief that the world would not go through another serious upheaval as World War I had been. It was going to be a little while before they realized that wouldn't happen. Leaders of the Jewish community responded quickly to Hitler's rise to power. At noon on July 11, 1933, a crowd gathered in the park at the south end of Spadina Avenue. Factories and businesses in the area were closed. 15,000 people marched to the provincial legislature at Queen's Park. Putting aside ideological differences, the community was protesting the rise of fascism. This was the first North American demonstration against fascism. Toronto's Jews were ahead of the New York community by a day. Banners and placards expressed concern about Hitler's anti-democratic, anti-union, and anti-Jewish rhetoric. Standing in the sweltering July heat, they listened to speeches and signed a petition addressed to the federal government in Ottawa. One of the organizers of the demonstration was Harry Simon. You were a very young man when this all took place. How old were you? Well, I was only 24 in 1933. But in those days, you, you carried the world on your shoulders when you were 24. And when you're 24, you expect a response from your government in Ottawa. What was the political reaction in Ottawa to the demonstration? Nothing whatsoever. Nothing whatsoever. But the march made the papers, and in Toronto, the resulting publicity startled the city. At a Christie Pitts baseball game between a Jewish and non-Jewish team, a banner displaying swastika was unfurled, and all hell broke loose. Fighting carried on in the park throughout the night. Well, there was a general uh, hostile feeling against, against immigrants in general, uh, and particularly against Jews. Uh, because of the unemployment, unemployment always breeds hostility against minorities. The feeling was that something horrible is, is coming upon us. As a matter of fact, uh, when Jewish people started leaving Germany, there was a ban against the immigration of Jews into Canada. Very few Jews were allowed to come in. And thousands could have been saved if the government policy would have been different. And uh, as a matter of fact, when Mackenzie King went to visit Germany, he came back uh, enthusiastic about Hitler's new order in Germany. The anti-Semitism of the baseball diamond was soon to be found in the adults' arena. In 1938, a rally was held in Maple Leaf Gardens. The situation for Jews in Germany was increasingly threatening. Jewish and Christian clergy called upon Ottawa and Prime Minister Mackenzie King to at least question Hitler's anti-Jewish policies. They wanted German Jews to be allowed to emigrate to Canada. But King and his government found the issue too hot. While Canada's Jews were informed that the issue was under investigation, Ottawa actively kept German Jews out.
Faith turned to disillusionment as the Jews of Spadina waited for an answer from Ottawa that never came. The country which had welcomed thousands of Jews not 50 years earlier was quietly turning its back. As the depression continued, the younger generation faced an increasingly uncertain future. But even if their options were limited, they fought hard for acceptance and self-respect, some more literally than others. As a champion amateur boxer, Sammy Luftspring had been invited to represent Canada in the 1936 Olympics in Germany. He declined. Instead, Sammy cashed in his chips and turned pro. Boxing was Sammy's way of escaping the poverty of a childhood spent in the back streets of Kensington Market. At the time when Sammy's father contracted tuberculosis, the poor often died from it. To help raise six kids, his mother turned to bootlegging. There was quite a few bootleggers in the area, but this was so perfect because of the laneway. There was a laneway, there is the laneway here, and uh, it came right out on Baldwin Street, and it was wonderful because if uh, the police would be uh, looking to bust in, they'd have to come through that lane, and uh, long before uh, my mother and father would be tipped off that the police were in the vicinity, so they would hide the whiskey, and uh, by the time the police busted in, well, they'd have a tough time finding the whiskey. You know, they just couldn't find it. They had uh, ingenious ways of hiding it. For the young man who had learned his strategy from watching the great fighters of the day in the newsreels, Sammy's victory over Frankie Genovese at Maple Leaf Gardens was a personal triumph. And I felt, well, here was a chance to make big money and be able to take care of my parents to get them out of this business. This is what really counted to me then. While Sammy fought, other Jews studied their way into the mainstream of Canadian society. The professions offered financial and social independence. We scraped and scrounged to find uh, bargains and, uh, and to look for, uh, for things that were, uh, you'd go shopping around to save a penny or two. Uh, mother used to go and buy live fish and you knew on Thursday night you couldn't, uh, couldn't go home and take a bath because the carp was in the bathtub swimming around so that she could eviscerate it and prepare it the next the next day. As a young man, Philip Gewertz was inspired by the local activists and politicians of Spadina. He too wanted a political career. In 1964, Mayor Phil Givens opened Toronto's new city hall. His parents, like so many others, went through hell to make sure their children got an education. I uh, was educated during the Depression. Uh, there was no unemployment insurance, there were no loans, there were no grants, and I felt discouraged. I just couldn't see how I would be able to finance my way through school to start with, and even if I could do that, how I could possibly start out on, in a profession or in a job to make my way, and it just looked just absolutely hopeless. And here I was sitting up in the garret, studying away, and all my friends were getting jobs and getting paid and going out and having a good time while I was sweating it out studying. And it just looked absolutely hopeless to me. And I simply told my father that I thought I was going to quit school about the age of 16. And of course, we had quite a session about that when he grabbed hold of me by the scruff of the neck, threw me against the wall, and he said, you'll be a bum if you quit school. And I said, no, I will not be a bum. I will be a union leader. And he said to my mother, hey, Mary, look what wants to be a union leader. And he threw me against the wall again. And he said, now listen to me, you punk. Only well, you use stronger language than that. First, you will finish school. Then we will talk about what you're going to do. In Jewish life, there is a famous expression Du soll sein ein Mensch. You should be a man. But not even with the tone of voice you should be a man. It has to be a humble tone. You should be a man. You should love your fellow man. You should do and try to do your very best for your fellow man. Not only Jews. When we speak of fellow man, we mean human beings the world over.
אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם, שחיינו וקימנו והגיענו לזמן הזה. The post-war period brought great changes to Spadina. Many of the organizations that had given the community a focus were based on the dream of a Jewish state. Now the reality of Israel changed their reason for being. The labor movement lost its urgency as a result of an economic boom. Toronto's annual Labor Day parade has become a reunion for what remains of the Jewish labor movement. The march past Spadina Avenue brings back memories of old battles won and lost. The communist movement is still alive, but for folks like Al Hershkowitz and J.B. Salzburg, the commitment to socialism ended in the 1950s. Even if the philosophy was good, the political expression of their ideals in countries like the Soviet Union was a bitter disappointment. When you spend a lifetime in a movement and you come to the conclusion, sadly enough, that perhaps you were wrong and uh, most everyone is mature, we're not youngsters, and uh, so we try to each make our own way, and many of us uh, joined the NDP, and I, of course, became active again in the union. I was elected business agent, and uh, in 1956, and I've stayed on ever since. Most of the Jewish community left Spadina in the 1950s. They moved to the new neighborhoods of North Toronto. One by one, the old Jewish landmarks have been claimed by others. Spadina Avenue in Dundas has become the center of the new Chinatown. Jews who came to Spadina sought a refuge, a place of freedom, but they found more. Some came to Spadina and made fortunes beyond their wildest dreams, while others found their fulfillment in the pursuit of a vision of social justice. And then there were those for whom Spadina was a place to live their religion without fear of persecution. Betty Troster's father was one of those people. My father was a very special person. His needs were few, although he had a tremendous sense of responsibility. He 
never aspired to gathering wealth. He philosophized in his studies that he would never want to own a business. He found to comply with religion, he had to have his own hours, be they uh, far into the night. He found at that time it was best for him to do uh, buying and, s and selling, which at that time was termed peddling. And in establishing himself in that occupation, he recommended it to anyone who turned to him for help in establishment. He would finance them each morning with a small sum of money so that they could begin their day of purchasing. And I'm, I'm more than certain that he would be completely unconcerned about the return of the financial uh, sponsoring. He had time to study. He had his finances looked after, his family settled, and his adored wife uh, by his side. Various people came to call, be it for neighborhood needs, be it for synagogue needs, be it for a feeding of political need. The discussions, which would very often be quite hot and heady, ranged from religion, apropos to politics, to the coming of the Messiah. I cherish my memories of that era, that period in my life. Fortunately for me, it was with warmth and, and understanding and, and a marvelous feeling. Do you miss your father? Terribly. Still do. Always think of him. Those Jews who remain on Spadina continue to hold services in the synagogue which was built by the men and women who came from Kiev, Russia. Sometimes they are joined by those who have moved away, but for whom success does not mean never look back. But for the majority of those who have moved away, Spadina lives on in memory. You know, uh, in Israel, I, I have gotten a perspective on these memories. One here, the continuous announcements where survivors memorialize their communities that have disappeared in East Theorem. When I think of the memories I have of Toronto, how different, how completely different they are than the memories that these people have of their towns in, 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 in Poland and the Ukraine and Lithuania. And um, sometimes when I hear them re reminisce, I envy myself. And sometimes I feel guilty. What, what can one say? 